Thank you. I've uh, been involved with IT since 1988, so I'm probably a, an old relic uh, compared to new relics, which is great software. Anyway, back in the 90s, I implemented uh, facilities maintenance management systems uh, globally for the federal government. And I used to go around to all the embassies, high commissions around the world, uh, putting in these systems, training the staff, doing all those things that you had to do. The first couple of years I spent time going to Kuala Lumpur. Most people probably know it as KL for short in Malaysia. And it was great. Now, since the first time I went there in 1991, I saw the old turf club turn into Petronas Towers up there in front of you. Now, for those of you who aren't aware, Petronas is Malaysia's national oil company. So it's a, it's a large outfit, and you, you probably may have seen them. If you follow international Formula One racing, they're there advertising, use our oil. Now, the company who, who developed the software that I specialise in said, look, next time you're going to Kuala Lumpur, can you go there and spend some time with the vendor and show them how you're using it for looking after facilities, for building sites and complexes and things like that? I said, sure, I'd love to. That would be great. And so it was all arranged. Well, I got to KL for short, and I gave Morang, and we organised a meeting. And then they asked me, I said, have you got an opportunity to help us out with a presentation for, for a building complex? Now, where the Australian High Commission is, it looks right across to Petronas Towers. And I looked out the window, I'm on the phone at the time, and I said, this wouldn't be for Petronas Towers by any chance, would it? And they said, no. Nah. I said, Phew, OK, because that would obviously need a bit more presentation time. Well, the big day came, and we were meeting, and uh, I get picked up, and we start driving around the outside road to the other side of the complex. And we end up at a building on the edge of the construction site, you probably see it up in the old picture up there at the top of the three o'clock position, looking right down on the construction site. I said, okay, this is interesting. Then we walk into the foyer, and the first thing I see is one of those beautiful architectural models of Petronas Towers. And the next thing I see is the construction managers for Petronas Towers. And I'm getting a bad feeling about all this, thinking, uh-oh, where is this going? Well, it so happens that the company and software that I specialised in was used for looking after petroleum industry products as well as factories and a whole range of other different sorts of software bits and pieces. And so it was common for these guys to try and think in that context of, oh, petroleum, Petronas Towers, that, that was it. So we go, we go in there and I'm thinking, this is, they said, no, it's all okay. So I'm just taking the word, I'm the guest here, so I just have to do what I'm told. Anyway, we walk into this meeting that's rolling from all day long. So they've got a group of consultants that come in, do a presentation, and then the next one comes in. And this is happening all the way along through the, through the day. So what happens is we enter this meeting and our guy gets up and he starts talking. And in the first minute, he starts talking about how you're going to use the software for maintaining an oil facility. They haven't read it right. And I'm thinking, oh, oh this is not good. <laughs> I'm thinking, we're going to be in this really ugly situation. And the other thing too is he's asked me and said, at the end of the meeting, I'll, I'll introduce you and you'll get a chance to speak to them as well. And kind of like the last five minutes. Now, there's one challenge when it comes to talking about petroleum plants as opposed to building facilities and things. They're completely different. It's a bit like talking about fishing in the Arctic for tuna versus trout fishing in the snowy mountains. The only similarities are water, hooks, and fish. And that's about it. The rest is completely different. So for 20 minutes, I sat in that meeting, and there I had to not say anything because of all the cultural sensitivities. And then it turns to me and he says, and I have Mr. Mundy here from Australia who is going to uh, share a couple of words with you. <laughs> what could I say? I stood there and I'm there and I said, thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. If you'd like to see a demonstration of the, uh, of the software, please call the vendors. We'd love to show it to you. <laughs> They'd love to show it to you. <laughs> what could I do? I was caught in that situation. It was my own personal Apollo 13 experience with a bad ending. It really was. But I always find it in life there's lots of things to learn. And there was a great story to learn out of this one. 
And it goes like this. There was, number one, how the vendor was seeing things. Secondly, there was how the specialist, that was me, was seeing things and how the potential customer was seeing it. It was a different view. So it's a story of understanding what people, people see. So the question is, how do we view things? A guy goes on a construction site. He works for a local magazine. And he's there and he sees the site supervisor and he's got to do a little talk and presentation and write an article up. And he says, look, I need to interview three people. So he says, sure, just don't take too much time. So he comes to this first guy who's wheeling a concrete, um, <clears throat> a concrete barrow full of concrete. And he says, what are you doing here? He says, well, I'm moving concrete. Writes a few notes, goes somewhere else around the, around the site, comes across a guy. He's got a, a trowel in one hand, a brick in the other hand. He says, so what are you doing here? He says, well, I'm building the brick walls. That's what I do. That's my job. Goes away. He writes a few notes. Then he comes to this last guy. And this guy's got a different coloured hard hat on. He's got a paper rolled up. And he says, so what are you doing here? He says, we're building a cathedral. Now, what we're talking about here is different views and different perspectives. And people see things in different ways. So there are things for us to understand when it comes to view. Firstly, there's obviously what we, what we see. Secondly, there's what we think we see. And thirdly, there's what we perceive. So in this picture, what do we see? Thomas, the tank engine. Right. He's sitting on the rails. He's looking at us. We see trees and surrounds around us. We understand and we all know that's most probably Thomas a tank engine or a good lookalike in that sense. What about what we think we see? All right, I want everybody to get ready for an exercise. And this is really important. I want you looking at the screen. Don't look at the person left or right of you. And what I'm going to have to do after one, two, three, you're going to yell out the first thing you see. Are you ready? Looking at the screen. Three, two, one. <laughs> Put up your hand if you saw the rabbit first. <laughs> okay. Put up your hand if you saw a duck first. Okay. Who can now see both? Yeah, okay. It's interesting how our mind can play tricks on us until we start slowly observing things. Then there's the what we perceive, and this is a classic example of well, we know icebergs are above the water, but it's, known, it's not until we actually do some study and understand that they are actually a lot bigger underneath the water. So why do I mention this story about views? In our case, as WordPress practitioners, we have to understand views. And when it comes to technology, we dearly love and hold the things about WordPress. We need to make sure that we can understand the view that we're seeing may not be the view that others are seeing as well. So to me, the WordPress community of people probably falls into three camps. We have um, number one, builders and maintainers. That would be people like plugin or theme developers, site support services and other additional services on there. Thirdly, I call them buyers. The second group, sorry, secondly, the group buyers. Buyers is anybody who's taken up that proposition, say, hey, I'm going to start using this tool. And then thirdly, are users, those who come to a website, order something, they come to read a blog, make a comment. So they're the three groups. How we view WordPress is determined on what camp we've come from. And there is nothing wrong with that. But there is a challenge for us in this room, in particular those who provide WordPress as a solution. And I call it attention. There's what we know we understand about WordPress, and this comes from our personal skills and our knowledge and what we've grown with the product. And then secondly, there's what we need to share with our customers about what we know about the product itself. So now we have to talk about the customers, what are they seeing? Well, when a customer has a problem or opportunity and technology involves, there's usually three things. 
some see a problem that needs to be fixed. Others see something as a means to an end. And thirdly, some see it as an enabler to solve a problem. So what we're dealing here with is a thing called viewpoints. How we see things from our point of view and how the customers see things from their point of view can sometimes be completely different. However, when it comes to this area of viewpoints, there is an enemy. And we have to be so careful of this enemy because they can damage the customer and our reputation and dealing with it. So who is this enemy? Are you ready for it? Well, it's us and it's me. We run the risk of not getting the customer's viewpoint correct in helping them understand about what we're offering as our solutions. So we have to be very careful, careful of this. I remember as a junior uh, design, uh, design uh, draftsman here working in Sydney in Milpera for the company that, that made General Electric refrigerators, air conditioning and cooling systems. The general manager comes down to us one day and he says to us, he says, boys, before you go out on the shop floor, think about your design, go out there, speak to the people who make the equipment. Go back inside, do some more designing, then go back, take your design to them, and they'll tell you whether it'll work or not. So there's an important point there, of listening and understanding what the customer has to say and how they see things. So too many times when it comes to WordPress, we get, taught, we get wound up in the capabilities and things it offers, and hey, it's great. I mean, it's one of the best tools out there. So we can be our own worst enemy to us and our customers. So what's a tool that we can use to sort of overcome this barrier and sort of help guide us in the right area so that we can make some really good logical choices and decisions for us and our customers? I say it's architecture. And you say, what? Architecture. Now I call it the skill of designing something that is artful, functional, manageable, serviceable and enduring. In other words, designing something that looks good, is easy and logical to use, can be easily managed and serviced, and it lasts a long time. We care about architecture as it allows us to develop logical, consistent approaches to delivery of solutions for our customers. When you have an architecture, it gives you three things. Number one, it's going to provide you with a useful context to developing solutions and making good decisions. Secondly, it's going to help you understand the capabilities needed for the future. And thirdly, it provides you the best possible solution that will be artful, functional, manageable, serviceable and enduring so the customer is able to do what they will need to do. So how do you get this? Well, by creating a target architecture. In other words, we need a target to aim at, a tool to help us design something that will be able to meet all those goals that we want. So what's an example of an architecture? Well, at the beginning of July, my wife and I decided to come to Sydney by train. Really, it was my choice. And the reason being is the last time I came to Sydney, I paid a good $7 or whatever it was to sit in the M5 tunnel on the south side and sit in a traffic jam for 40 minutes. And I said, that's it. Well, we arrived at Central Station on our little journey. And I think it's an amazing place. I grew up in Sydney, so we used to come here a lot. And, uh, and that's the way, way it is. Anyway, on our way back to Canberra, we had to go through the station again. I took some time to take some pictures. I looked around and came across some presentation boards. So we then went downstairs and, and grab, uh, grabbed the coffee. And so I'm down there and I had that, you know, that itch that had to be scratched. Oh, tell me about this, how this all happened. And here's what I, had, what I found out. I had that, oh my goodness, I couldn't believe this. Especially when we're talking about architecture here as well. So it goes like this if you aren't aware. So in the late 1800s, a Queensland railway draftsman moved to Sydney to take up a job working for the railways. Now he completed his studies in engineering and was soon promoted to engineer. 
Sydney was growing, the rail system was overstressed, so they needed to do something and do something for the future. So the engineer submitted his design and came up with a threefold plan. You're going to love this. He said, number one, develop a hub and spoke model, that's my modern talk on it, using a central station. Secondly, he came up with this plan, develop a railway city circle to service the heart of the city, the heart of Sydney. And thirdly, he said, build a bridge across the harbour so trains could service the northern suburbs and allow trains to go to the northern beaches. Yes, the beaches. Now, the guy who architected this was none other than John Bradfield, who was better known for his design of the Harbour Bridge. And you may have heard his name in that context before, but did you know about the other stuff? Can you see the three problems that Bradfield was solving? Well, number one, he was bringing together a geographically disconnected rail network for easy access. Secondly, he was providing a platform for, wait for it, great technology term, interoperability across Sydney, the Harbour Bridge, motor vehicles, trains, trams, cyclists, pedestrian ship, all could facilitate and use this service. And thirdly, he was providing greater access to more places around Sydney. So how did he do it? Well, he used existing design patterns and typically the big one was underground tunnels allow trains to, get a, to get in the, not get in the way of above the ground. I think I missed a slide there, have we? Okay, he used, he used existing design patterns um, and underground tunnels to allow the trains not to get in way above ground. And secondly, he utilised the natural elements of Sydney's sandstone and the wonderful foundation for building strong and stable tunnels. And thirdly, he incorporated proven processes uh, there <coughs> where people could flow from going underground to get above on top of the, the, the platform. So the other thing about what he did too was if you have a look at the design that was put in place, it's endured and it looks great. And that's how Central Station is. So what is this thing called a target architecture? He was aiming for something that was going to be built over a long period of time. Well, having a target architecture for building um, WordPress Solutions is probably like having a brilliantly designed Sydney Rail Network. Designed in the early 1900s over a 50 year period, functional, interoperable and usable, scalable, extensible, that's what they're doing on it now, and integrated so that people can flow from all the transport systems of buses, trains, trams and ferries all into one. So, a target architecture is a view of a future state or something to be or being developed. So when it comes to WordPress, there is, there is no one target architecture, okay? However, there are ways to develop a target architecture particular to your needs and your customers' needs. So let's look at the foundations for building a target architecture, starting with the fundamentals. Funnily enough, you might be thinking this is a, a gee whiz wow technology solution, but it's not. A target architecture has three legs. Vision, values and principles, and these guide the architecture. So by having a vision, values and principles around how we develop WordPress solutions, what we're doing is we're setting ourselves up for success. So how do I do this? Well, you start by doing some detective work about your own desired architecture and then when you've got a fit understanding for that, you can also start looking at your customer's architecture. Now, it sounds very meaty, but it's actually a really worthwhile exercise. And look, here's what's worked well for me. I'm developing myself a project and eventually I'd love to take it to market one day. And here's how I've done it. I've worked out what I wanted for the vision for my project that fitted in with my goals. And secondly, I've determined the, what the requirements are that I need for that. And I've put those, back, that, those key activities into a mind map, and then I've built a WordPress prototype assessing plugins based on my values and principles. You'll see that in a minute. So you set a target architecture in its own right. So let's see how this is done with the work of a vision. All right, like Bradfield and his train problem he was trying to solve, you have to have a vision. 
All right? His is a fully graded, integrated train network that people can access across the city. Now, for you, you're going to have to have a vision for what you want to do with your architecture. Really important. Now, for your customers, you're going to have to find out what their vision is. And say if it's a greenfield site, find out what architecture can help them. Or they may already have an architectural model for their business. Typical questions that come up when you're trying to find out this vision stuff. What is the problem you're trying to solve? What is the problem you're trying to solve? What do you want this thing to do? Whether it's a service or it's an app or whatever or website, say in two to three, five years from now. Second question is, why do you want to do it? You can't ask a what question without a why question and vice versa. And the third thing is, where do you see your business going over that period of time as well? So when you get the answer to these questions, you can start working backwards and start seeing what's needed and look at things in a practical way. So what's worked well for me is having a thing called a baseline architecture. So that's the base where we start from and then looking forward and helping other people, I can then determine what's going to be a target architecture to help them. So ask questions about the vision and using your target architecture, you're going to see whether WordPress capability can meet that vision. So here's a way to assist you there. So here's that point I was talking about. Number one, depending if it's you or your customers, look at your own organisation, client or vision, understand the stuff there. Secondly, from the vision statement, put together a high-level uh, high view of key functions. And thirdly, assess key components required to achieve the functionality in mind, aligning it with the vision as well. So this is all done in conjunction as part of that three-legged stool I was talking about. So this is just one part of it. But while we're moving to that other leg of the stool, let's talk about values. Well, when it comes to values, corporations rely on them to shape how they do things. Now, values are fundamentally a belief system. It's what the organisation believes in. I had one of those aha moments as a junior uh, architect, and I went to the boss and said, where do we get the corporate values from? And she was so nice. She said to me, she says, have you had a look in the annual report? That would be a great place to start. She knew full well where they, where they were. But today, most corporations, organisations have them plastered on their website, what they believe in. So how do values affect technology and architecture? Well, let's go back to the WordPress playbook just so we can understand how they express it. Okay, and we have looked at There's two key statements in bold. It says, we believe great software should work with a minimum setup so you can focus on sharing your story. Secondly, we believe in democratising publishing and freedoms that come with open source. Whenever you see that, we believe, that's a value statement. People are after that information. So, as a practical example, how could we do that? All right, say that you've gone and put a submission in to Nike, you know the sports shoe people, and you've won a job to actually develop a specialised website for them. How would you start trying to get and understand what they want in a system and that aligns with their values? And this is really important. Let's have a look at those Nike values. First of all, you need to get to know the values intimately. Have a good mind about studying it inside out and get to know it. We use that to do this all the time with government stuff all the time. The second thing is you have to get ready to do some aligning of things like systems qualities like designability, usability, securability, learnability. Now, this architecture thing actually does get messy, believe you me. And what's going to happen is your role is to turn chaos into beauty. And you need some sort of mapping exercise to do that. So what we have to do is we have our um, system qualities there the third thing we're going to do, which brings in this messiness, is we have to do a mapping exercise and bring it all together. Now, see where they start aligning and picking off different things you can see there? Easy to learn, master the fundamentals. They're really big on that, wanting people to get things early. So you're looking and seeing what they expect in their systems. Why do we do this stuff? We think, oh, this is just all words and stuff. Because at the end of the day, 
the shareholders and also in the parliament, the senators will come back and say, so how did this align with that? It always comes back. So your job or our job is to make sure that we get this stuff right. All right. So to get to the core values, you'll have to dig around and when designing solutions, understand how your proposal will align with their values. All right, so here's a food for thought. What are your values? And here I put some together which you may want to consider. Okay? You need to understand your own values before you can understand someone else's values. Our customers deserve the best platform for solution. That could be one. We recommend the best solutions that will endure over time. That could be another one. We believe in Australia and recommend Australian services. That could be another one. So there's some values to think about. But lastly, what about principles? Well, <clears throat> we always need a compass to go in the right direction, and we all need direction. Now, if you don't think you need direction, then you're at the wrong train platform. WordPress principles are found in its philosophy. And we see there, out of the box, design for majority, decisions not options, strive for simplicity, deadlines not arbitrary, the vocal minority, our Bill of Rights. Really important that someone like WordPress has actually put them up there as a good guide for us to think about as well. So how do we use principles? Well, let me show you from my experience how I use principles to choose hosting that I use for WordPress. Well, principles have been a key uh, factor in me determining from day one how I move forward with WordPress. And so early in my journey, I started hosting in the US, as probably many of you may have done. The price was right. Hey, the internet was the internet, so why not? Well, as my business portfolio grew of uh, customers I was looking after, I was also doing work um, with privacy for data for the federal government and Parliament of Australia. And hosting came up on the radar in terms of keeping information in Australia. Now, my US hosting provider had a really great chat ser service and they decided to move stuff to this Indian subcontinent to keep up with the, you know, the daylight hours more or less. But there were some challenges, became frustrating, it's still a great company, but it was a trigger for me to say, hmm, I think I might start looking at some other opportunities. So thinking about that too is also saying, you know what, this is going to be a really awkward exercise as well. So I started developing my principles. And here's what I came up with. Okay, hosting the website had to be in Australia, had to be 24 by 7 support, support had to be easily contactable, it had to be shared, um, hosting and potentially dedicated services, and I had to have experience in WordPress. And it wasn't until I came to WordCamp in 2011 that I met Alan Harris from, from WP Hosting. And I asked Alan, why would I host in Australia versus why would I host in the US? Alan gave me several good reasons, and one being that Google preferences local hosting. So I thought, well, why not? So from there, I put my, uh, one of my websites as a prototype with WP Hosting, and then over time, I eventually moved uh, to a dedicated service with them. So we have some, an excellent working relationship, and it's great to be able to talk to someone via help desk or the phone, and that has worked really well for my business following that principle. That's an infrastructure or a, a WordPress type principle. What about other principles about how you determine what plugin am I going to use? Okay. What about what theme am I going to use? I've gone through all those different things in those different areas making decisions based on principles. I sometimes get it wrong. I'll, I'll be honest about that. I've looked at some of the sizes up and then all of a sudden, well, that didn't work very well, did it? But as long as you have a guiding set of principles, you're going to have a compass to help you in the, in the future. So to sum up, the three-legged stool. Vision, values, principles, use these as a guide to developing a target architecture for you and your customers. Today we're really scratching the surface of technology architecture. However, my goal is to show you that building stuff that's going to be valuable for a long time requires three key elements. Number one is you need to see from the customer's perspective what they need to see. Okay. The second one is establishing models for building your own target architecture for a baseline. Then thirdly, building 
building enduring solutions for customers and yourselves based on proven, tried and tested architectures you have developed. WordPress has the ability to solve many problems and it's up to you how you apply it to the situation at hand. Use it, respect it, it's a really powerful tool. But make sure how you use it and how you project it and how you put forward to help someone else's solution is something that's going to last and endure for a long time. Any questions? Thank you very much, Chris. i will um, got some mics here. If anyone has any questions, can you please throw your hand up now and we'll run a mic out to you. Um, awesome stories. Chris, I really enjoyed your storytelling style. Um, has anyone else got some? Yep. Oh. Question. Sure. Have you got a template for us about how to pitch for the government projects? <laughs> Pitching to government contracts is really interesting. There's a whole lot of boxes you have to tick off, but if you go to Tender, I think they've got a lot of the templates there, if you're not familiar with that, and they put jobs up there all the time. A uh, number of bigger Canberra uh, agencies who do that sort of work and do it all the time and do it very well and are in, are in that space. So Austender is a great place to start and you can look at, see how, how you do it there. So it's, and they've got a number of things that have to be done in terms of meeting social obligations as well. That's okay. So you just head down that path and um, they, they always, always make sure if you're going for a government contract that you answer the questions the way that they've got them there. All right. Bit of a black art, but once you get the style, it's all like, it makes sense and it's actually quite simple because I know I've recently been helping out some evaluation for tenders for a department and one of the, some people just went off and Planet X and they just said, they answered the question that was there and it would have been easy. So, yeah, f follow that. There's also a um, digital marketplace these days set up by the Digital Transformation Office. Yes. Where there's a whole bunch of service providers and the government just comes and picks people off there for pre-approved services. Um, any other questions out there? Throw your hands up. We've got a few minutes before we break for the afternoon. Nothing else? All right, well, um, can you please join me in uh, thanking Chris Thank Mundy?